Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see you guys this evening. I am with Exclusive Books at Gateway, and our retail group, together with Safiso Publishers, has amazing pleasure to welcome you this evening. We hope you have an engaging and stimulating evening. Um, we are launching Equal Different by Dr. Judy Dlamini, and I have with us Miss McKenzie, who's going to help me and us to moderate this launch. Now, Miss McKenzie, I have come to understand a lot of people know her on the basis of her being an on air presenter at Ukosi FM. And she is also the owner of a communications company. Okay? And she's a communication strategist, as I understood it to be. Also, she has an MBA from Stellenbosch University. And she recently accepted onto their PhD program. So we, we congratulate you and we wish you all the best. And ladies and gentlemen, as I said, thank you, welcome. We wish you have a great evening. I'm now handing you over to Ms. McKenzie. Thank you very much, Stephen. Sanbanan? Ninjan? I am so thrilled to see the venue fill to capacity. I am so thrilled to see us all come out to support the launch of this book. And just on, on that basis, if we can just all just give a round of applause <laughs> to the fantastic work of Dr. Judy Lamini, and thank you very much for joining us this evening. It is going to be a panel discussion. We're going to be engaging on the content of the book, which is derived from Dr. Lamini's PhD. So you, you've read, if you, by show of hands, who's got a copy of the book? Ah, oh, fantastic joy. If you haven't gotten yourself a copy of the book, you can. Um, there are copies on sale. And if your copy is not signed, I have a signed copy. Thank you very much. You can get your copy signed. Dr. Judy Lamini will be available for book signings. And if you haven't got your book yet, please do get yourself a copy of the book. It is available outside. So it is a panel discussion with our panelists. There will be an opportunity to also interact and engage with the content of the book through our panelists. And I'd like to, at this stage, call Dr. Judy Lamini up, the author of the book. And if we can just give her a round of applause as she makes her way. <laughs> Mr. Mazwi Kaba, editor of the Sunday Tribune. <laughs> Mpume Langa, provincial executive Bidvest Bank, Guazulu Natal. She's also the chair of the Women in Business um, Forum at the Chamber of Commerce and Business. And she's also the former chairperson of BWA in KZN. Mr. Alibi Oluwatobi, who is a student, a postgraduate student in clinical psychology at the University of KwaZulu Natal. <laughs> and Dr. Mariam Sidat Khan, who is a sociologist and senior lecturer at the University of KwaZulu Natal. <laughs> Dr. Lamini, the book, the entire study on which the book is based equal but different. I'm intrigued by the title, equal but different, because a lot of people would say woman versus man, unequal. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for coming. We don't take it for granted. Uh, I'd like to thank Exclusive Books and the Sifiso Publishers. Uh, Sifiso Publishers is represented by my husband, Sizwe Masana. Uh, who I am so grateful that, as always, he's come all the way to support me. Uh, I don't take it for granted. Uh, I have so many people that uh, made this book possible. And uh, I've got families, the Mbegani family, led by Sister Nonchancha, who's here, uh, Notobile. I've got uh, so many, actually, my sister, Ukau. I, I won't mention everyone by name, but I really, really, from the bottom of my heart, say thank you for coming. Uh, the panelists uh, that I have, uh, I'm very lucky actually to have the panelists uh, that I have tonight. Uh, starting with the moderator uh, who I met uh, where she was officiating and um, she was recommended to me by someone else. I was like, hmm, 
Uh, my goodness, I hope I can get her because she's brilliant. And obviously we share love for education as you've heard. And then Professor Stella Ngomo, who's uh, actually contributed the foreword to the book, uh, recommended uh, Dr. Mariam Sidat Khan, and uh, she's a sociologist and uh, she, she's just an amazing academic, a mother, a wife. And uh, she introduced me to Toby. Uh, because it was quite important that we hear the voice of a millennial and uh, it, it's actually even better that we have a voice of a male uh, who's a millennial. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Toby, for being here. And uh, we have another millennial, Bumpumi, uh, a mother, a wife, and a, a, a businesswoman, and we're lucky uh, to have her to come and uh, address uh, her perspective of the book. And we have Umazwi, uh, Umazwi Klaba, uh, the editor, as you've heard, uh, who brings uh, the man's voice uh, in media, in business, but also a parent. Why equal but different? Right. And it's important that it's in that order. Equal but different. Because the main word is equal. Because I truly believe that people are born equal but different. Their differences are a strength, depending on how you see them and how you use them. So even before I thought I would write a book, which by the way was never a dream, uh, but it's funny how when you dream of certain things, uh, then they actually channel other dreams and uh, then you just allow destiny to drive you uh, to the other dreams that develop from some of the dreams that you start off with. Um, the book, as uh, most of you know, came out of my doctoral thesis that looked at the intersection of race, gender, and social class. Um, it was important for me uh, to understand the uh, intersection of different social identities because each one of us is not just black if you are black, and you're not just a woman if you're a woman, but there are so many other things that coexist with the social identity that the many different social identities that you, you, you come with. And uh, the way the world interacts with you is based on the social identities that they identify in you. Why did I choose this topic? I chose the topic because if you actually look at all the scholars, uh, information, especially research, tends to come from the Western world. It tends to come from developed world. And uh, even within those uh, geographies, it tends to be middle class women and it tends to be white middle class women. But the problem is that having had such an isolated uh, group of people, we then generalize and pretend as though that is the view which actually encompasses all the different views. And uh, that actually worried me because uh, I, I, I truly believe that we need a voice as African. Africans. We need to tell our stories. And uh, it's interesting, uh, Mbume, you are the previous uh, president of the regional uh, Biwasa. And uh, I remember that uh, I used to, Professor Stella Ngomo was uh, my initial supervisor for my doctorate. And I have a lot of respect for her. She's a very respected uh, scholar and an A-rated um, research. Uh, I mean, uh, my age is beautiful in that you forget words. And then <laughs> instead of blushing though, at my age, you don't blush. You just say that you've forgotten the word. So. <laughs> so so Prof Ngomo and I used to go to these, uh, used to call them a survey that was yes. supported by NetBank, yes. And uh, you know the census, yes, it's all right. And then you'd go there and uh, all you'll hear is just figures. Uh, only 3% of the CEOs of JSC listed companies are women. And each time I would come out of these and thinking, I wonder, I would love to hear the voice of these women. Who is this 3%? What's their story, you know? So that actually started the thinking in my head that we need to hear their stories because numbers don't help us and the numbers are not changing. Surely something has to be done, but something cannot be done unless you understand what the issues are. And the best people to tell you what the issues are are the women themselves. And um, 
you'll see that in the book, though I interviewed 20 women, uh, not all of them agreed to be in the book. So I actually had to then bring other women for the book specifically. And some of the women that I brought, brought to the book, like with Dr. Pumzilim Lambongoga, it was informed by the women that I interviewed who actually said she empowered me. She was a mentor to me. And uh, if you look at the men uh, in the book, I brought in the men in the book, though they were not part of the study. And the reason for that is that one of the things that came out uh, from the research is that men are critical if we are to change the status quo. And it makes sense. If you look at the different sectors of society, if you look at government, if you look at business, you look at a church, and uh, you look at just society in general, men actually have the biggest voice because they are the leaders. And uh, everyone knows that leadership is everything. It doesn't matter how much you bang on the door wanting to have a change, but unless you have buy-in from men, that change is not going to happen. So it's important that you have the voice of the man uh, if we are actually to change the status quo. And I truly believe that we are going to change the status quo. I cannot leave the world to my daughter and my granddaughter the way I found it. I'm sure each one of you feels the same way. Not because it's to the benefit of women, but because it's to the benefit of the world because a world that celebrates everyone and the potential of each person and actually levels the playing field of each person will definitely be a better world. Uh, just, I know I'm taking a lot of time. I only- You're allowed, it's your launch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got so many quotations that come to mind. I'm just thinking of what Michelle Obama says. She says, um, if you look at countries that are in trouble, and you look at countries that are flourishing, more often than not, the countries that are doing well are countries that value their women, you know? And if you look at the book, almost invariably, the women in the book, they had someone who told them when they grew up that they can be anything they choose to be. So the message we give to our boys and girls as mothers, as fathers, is very important because when they face the world, which is quite a tough and cold world, having that voice that they remind themselves of that I can be anything, it's so important. So that message is very important. If you look at most of them, they actually were married and they had supportive uh, husbands. What doesn't come through in the book is that of the 20 women that I interviewed, four of them had husbands who actually took a back seat in terms of their own careers and said, you are doing so well professionally and the kids are getting compromised in the process, but it's important that one of us takes care of the family and you actually go and chase that uh, ladder, which is exemplary. The only downside is that none of them agreed to be in the book. And a part of me understands why. Two of them were white South Africans, one was a colored South African, and one was an African American. And these men are actually professional men. It's not as though because you are a professional and I'm not, then I'll actually uh, allow you to know. It's actually, so what I'm saying is that our men mean the world to us. And my husband has supported me from day one up to this very day. Whatever I do, he's been my support, my pillar, and I thank him for that. I don't take it for granted ever. I can go on forever, and I can't, but we haven't got time. I'll hand over to Maz. Thank you. Nangu. Thank you very much. B before we come to Umazu, um, one of the things that we, we chatted about, Mam Chuti, was I, I was attending something else elsewhere. And I think this is something that also Dr. Um, Sidat Khan can touch on. And one of the women that was speaking there, she said, one of the reasons women don't succeed is because we brought up to fear men. 
and not to see men as equal and as people that we can stand and on the same stage as and stand up at the same lectern as and compete equally. We are socialized to step back and give men the limelight. And we chatted about it, and I'm, and I'm gonna come to your perspective in terms of the book and, and what that revealed. Socialization, as a sociologist, as, as um, Mum Judy was saying, we bring to the fore all of us. We, I'm not just a woman. I am the woman that I was raised to be. I am the woman that I am. I am the woman that's influenced by the people around me. The impact on that, on, on such information that comes out in, in terms of how we interact with men, how we interact, how we present ourselves in the workplace and our ability to succeed. Yes. Yes, please. So, in response to your question, um, the, the reality of this evening um, can be traced back to uh, the investment made in um, Judy by her mother, Rita uh, Nguane, okay? And the investment that her mother made in her, because there's an interconnectedness, um, an intersectionality in terms of what she was taught, who the significant other was. And it came out in all of the stories. And in reality, what we need in order to succeed is we need one person to believe in us. Who is that significant other? Because we've seen a beautiful demonstration of, of significant other happening here across this stage, but who is this significant other that you talk about? So the significant other could have been her mother, the primary caregiver at the very outset of your life, the person that you're most dependent on. Um, a grandmother, a father, an aunt, um, we come. We have a rich, complex history. We weren't all brought up by our mothers in a nuclear family, because uh, apartheid destroyed it. It it sliced up uh, the traditional family system into hundreds of pieces. It displaced people. So we grew up with maternal figures. So our significant other, from a psychological perspective, is that one person that has the most impact. Because we're born with, we're all born like sponges. Uh, and we learn everything. We learn our language, we learn how to speak, we learn how to like specific foods. Uh, we learn how to talk. Um, and as we get older, we realize this when uh, we, we look at ourselves as adults and we think, oh my God, I am my mother. Oh my God, I am my father. Yes. And that's genetics and socialization. Mbomi, one, one of the things that um, you mentioned when we had the opportunity to discuss the content of the book, and it also touches very much on, um, on Mazui, you are corporate. You live, breathe corporate. And well done on your new journey as the provincial executive for business, um, for, for, for Bidvest Bank, but you've been in banking all your life, most recently heading up private banking Guazulu Natal at APSA. So your experience in corporate, in terms of what Mum Judy was saying, Mum Judy, Dr. Judy. Mum Judy. <laughs> um, in terms of what she was saying, in terms of the, the voice of men is critical. The sponsorship of women, when I talk sponsorship, I talk within the corporate environment, within the workplace, the advocacy, the advocacy voice of men in that setting, is it as important? You know, what, you, what you're saying is so important because very often we think that for women to succeed, they need women mentors, women sponsors. In business, action happens in the boardroom. And if your career path is not supported by somebody in that boardroom, you will not see a promotion, or a scholarship, or some program at Gibbs, or anything else like that. You need to have an advocate on your behalf, who will be your voice. And if you read, um, those who read the book, we'll see that in, the, in a few stories, Puti, Marinelle in particular, her sponsor was Cyril Ramaphosa. And I like what he said. May I read it quickly, please? Yes. Okay, because I have it open, funny enough. I must have preempted a question. It's on page 142. He says, he was asked, why is, this, why is this so pro-empowerment of women? 
He says, I want us to unleash the power that they have, women have, to really demonstrate what they're capable of doing. I took a view from the woman whom I have worked with. That woman do tend to have capabilities that sometimes we don't recognize as men. So it took this man to acknowledge that women can get things done. And if as a man I can see that women can get things done, I must then act upon that belief and that um, faith in women. And it took Putti on, uh, on board and mentored her. And the, the rest is history because you know what she became. And it took that one man to be her advocate, her mentor, and her voice in that boardroom. And said, I will take a chance on this woman. Yes, you may say no in the boardroom as men, but I'm saying to you, I will take this chance and make sure she succeeds. So we and need men to take chances on us. Well, in my career of my own, in my almost 20 years in banking now, I can count a few men. If they're not in my life, I won't be where I am today. So we need men to be advocates. And it's interesting that you speak about it takes one man or many men across um, the, the lifespan of your career to recognize, as um, Cyril Ramaphosa said, to recognize those special qualities that will help that woman succeed. Because what he in the book says on that same page 144 is that successful women have the following commonalities, the willingness to lead, the hunger for success, the determination, and humility. One thing that really stood out for me from what he said was, humility earns women respect versus aggression. And we've got this whole thing, oh, I must wear the pants. I've got to put on the pants when I go into the boardroom. And I, and I, and I think to some extent you do need to, but it's important that he highlights. And this is a seasoned leader and who has mentored other seasoned leaders who says it's the humility of women that earns them respect versus aggression. Your critical voice as a man. Do you men recognize that? Do you men live up to it in the context of, of uplifting women? Do you see that happening as a man that sits with other men in the boardroom? In the book, what did you pick up in that context? The book was very, very uh, inspiring. You very much, are. yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. First, I must just say thank you to Dr. Lamini for, for uh, inviting me to take part in this. Um, uh, I've known Dr. Labini for many years as a doctor. I'm from Umlazi, so I used to see her and, and Mr. Masane over there, and uh, they are my, you know, heroes. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, initially, I was quite scared, uh, you know, being uh, invited to take part in this because I don't really consider myself. Uh, I don't think I qualify. I'm not an academic, I'm not a, a feminist, I don't know if I qualify, <laughs> uh, but, but I really, really enjoyed the book. I, I was also, you know, you know uh, taking the book, I thought it would be a, a heavy academic uh, a, 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 a book that, it, it starts very heavy in, in, in the beginning uh, with those, those uh, hard uh, stats about how uh, unequal our society is, how, how the whole global uh, society is unequal, how, how much work there, there still is to, to be done out there to, to ensure that there's uh, e equality. But, but I really, really found it in inspirational, accessible, so, so readable, uh, especially the part where uh, Dr. Labini uh, speaks to the women leaders about their personal experiences, how they got to where they are. Um, that That is really, really I I inspirational stuff. To answer your question whether we are as men doing enough, I, I, I don't think so. You know, the, the, the book opened my eyes. Uh, I'm, I'm 51 years old. I thought I knew but, but I learned uh, quite a lot. Uh, we, we don't do enough. I started reflecting. I've just finished a, a chapter uh, on my life in the newspaper business, uh, ranging over 20, 25 years. Uh, you know, and I realized, you know, we, we, we don't do enough. Uh, I've been eight months in, in my new job as the Sunday Tribune editor. The, 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 in my previous job, 
the, the new editor is a woman. And, 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 and I, I just start, started only now reflecting about that. I played, I must admit, I didn't play any part in that woman uh, getting that job. It was my, my executive chairman who decided it's time that uh, Isola, is a, the biggest newspaper in the country, is, is led by, by a woman. So to answer your question, I think we, 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 there's so much more that we can do. And interestingly, you, you answer that in, in that final sentence. It was your executive chairman that decided that it's high time that Isolez would be led by a woman. Your executive chairman. That important, critical sponsorship voice of a man. It, it's, it's important that we, we recognize that because it's that recognition that allows us to then reshape it. Until you, don't, until you recognize it, you, you can't reshape it. And it's interesting in terms of the, um, the stats that you were talking about. Uh, in one of the excerpts from the book, it says, if we advance the equality of women, we grow the global economy by $12 trillion. Do the mathematics and turn it to rands. Mm -hmm. yeah, Don't know that, how many zeros that is. That was my favorite part of the <laughs> book. That's page 132. Oh. <laughs> pa page 132, everyone. Because, I mean, it, 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 it just opens your eyes. It, it make, it, suddenly you realize that it, it makes business sense for, for, for businesses to, to, to empower women. And, and then it, it, it makes develop, developmental sen sense for governments to, to work towards equality. Because suddenly there's growth, 12 trillion rent, how many zeros there? <laughs> uh, incredible. Thank you very much, Mazu. It, it's interesting um, when we talk about the developmental role and the economic contribution, or the, the developmental contribution and the developmental agenda from a government side, and the business side of it, and how it makes sense from that perspective. Because one of the things, um, for those who've got a copy of the book, and for those, for all of us who are still going to get a copy of the book before we leave, one of the things that Dr. Mlambo Nguka, who was also interviewed in the book, one of the things that she highlights globally, the quota is 30% women, 70% men. And one of the things that she very clearly articulates is that when we stipulate 30% as a global quota, we are affirming 70%. Yes. Mr. Oluwatobi, a young man, you're a millennial. We are told things are changing. We are told women are more empowered. We are told young ladies of your age group are more empowering. So, are more empowered. So, the perception is that there would be less work for you men to do as you rise up the ladder, as you grow. In terms of your takeaway when you read this book, as a young man, as a student of sociology, the lessons that the generation prior has have learned and the impact of the men that were interviewed in the book, the generation prior to yours. What's your takeaway? Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I count it a great privilege to be here, 6,000 kilometers away from Southern Africa, and I'm on this table. You see, I, the book is very insightful. It's very, very insightful, and I commend Dr. Delamini for packaging an academic piece in a biographical manner that is simple but yet very very educative and informative. You see, I was saying something to Dr. C that unlike most um, theoretical discussions, she taught me theory last year, you know, so at my first postgraduate year, unlike most theoretical discussions, as a clinical sociology student, I've read a lot of academic materials on gender, race, class, inequality, but this is very unique in the sense that it is simple, but yet you can understand the narratives around gender issues around class and around um, um, race, you see. So, like you said, do men of my category feel threatened that there will be less job for women? I don't actually see it that way. You see, even though we've made um, a lot of progress as a people, like Obama, the former president of the United States of America, noted in that book, there's still a lot that needs to be done. For me, I believe, as a Global South scholar, that um, the transformation we've seen in gender empowerment is, uh, is, a is, is, is a farce. It's not what we intend it to be. It's not what it should be. It's more like a pity. 
It's more like we are trying to just incorporate people. And that's the same issue I face as a black child. It's like you're just pitying me. You don't recognize my importance yet. You don't know I have something to bring on the table yet. And that's my problem with quotas. I don't have a problem with quotas, but they should be done without prejudice. It should be quotas because you recognize the fact that I want to be the CEO of APSA, not because I'm black or because I'm a woman, but because they have the ability and the capacity to do the job. You see? So those are the issues that resonate to me outside that book. Because it's not just about having 30%. Are we fulfilling governmental affirmative actions or we are recognizing the importance of humans? You see, I wrote a short synopsis about the book and at the conclusion I said something. Until we all recognize the fact that there is something that bonds us that is beyond race, that is beyond gender, that is beyond sex, that is beyond sexual orientation, and that is the fact that we are all humans. That's the first category. It's from humans, you take it down to race black, white, colored, whatever. But we are all humans. Until we understand that every human has an innate right to live the kind of life that their ability gives them, we are not set for transformation yet. Transformation is possible. Transformation the likes of Dr. Delamine clamors for. I read a piece last year. It's by Andre Dawkins. It's calling for a 24 hours for men to stop rape against women but we live in a community where women are raped every minute. You know, so gender issues go deeper than what we think it is. And that's the importance of this story to me. Someone said, a popular English philosopher, that um, anyone that does not learn history is doomed to repeat it. And that's where the book resonates. The book has been able to capture the lived experiences of all these women so that we can learn, we can see how we can amend the mistakes we can correct and how we can build on them. So I am not treating as a man that there is empowerment for women. I am saying more should be done to empower women. When we go back to how I conducted a research about um, reasons why women don't progress higher in postgraduate studies last year, and I actually discovered we have more women at undergraduate level, 53% of them. There are more. But when you get to the honors level, it drops. When you get to master's level, it drops. When you get to the PhD level, it's minimal. So that means there's still something wrong to the transformation we said we have experienced. And those are the issues. No threat for any woman. I want to see them. I want to see them. <laughs> I see my mom, I see my sisters, I see my friends and my colleagues. I believe we are all equal partners that have something to put on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much. One of the things that um, Dr. Lamini highlighted is the support that Uba Bungasana has given her throughout her career in the various aspects of, of her career. And I had the opportunity to interact with him in a different context. And it's so encouraging to see a more matured male who has walked the journey and hearing yourself speak the same language. Because one of the things that Uba Bungasana said was that he looked at Umam Judy as his wife and she could have specialized as a doctor, but she prioritized family because the world of work is not designed for you to go that much further and still be able to balance family. And his daughter, being in the investment world, also facing the, the same thing. And it's so encouraging to hear future leaders recognize that because that means more is possible as we go forward. I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Um, if you have had a, an opportunity to read the book, it would be great to hear from you your questions stemming from, from content you might have read. Maybe your interest has been piqued just from hearing and you are going to get a copy of the book. You're going to buy one outside and get it signed. But something has piqued your interest. It's an opportunity to pose a question to our panelists. And it would be interesting to hear the, the questions from the men the panel. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And Dr. D, congratulations on this milestone in your own life, as well as your academic career. We've watched it and we've admired it um, as guests throughout my whole life. And um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, particularly being a young woman who's also mid-career, and you, one of the things you've done with almost ease as we've watched it, is transform and continue to reinvent yourself. 
You started as a doctor in the world of medicine, very much community-based medicine, and you've evolved into a businesswoman, a businesswoman who's not just interested in the business of medicine, but in the business of luxury goods, as you've gone on to do. You're now an author, you're very interested in academia. Those transitions, could you maybe take us through um, what it takes as a woman to keep reinventing ourselves and why it's so important to, to continue to do that and how best we do that without losing touch with what we're passionate about, without losing touch um, with what we um, aim to be our purpose in, in the world, and of course without losing touch um, about making an impact because in spite of the difference of the worlds that you've impacted on, you've made a huge impact um, on individuals, but also in those particular spaces. How do you keep that golden touch and longevity as long as you have? Um, you know, uh, I always say to young people, it's uh, one of the important things that uh, we don't tell our kids as much as we should. I was actually quite impressed that, Dr. Mariam, that uh, you were telling Toby that we're now looking for a wife <laughs> and you need credentials. Our partners are so important in who we become uh, because you actually journey along this person. Uh, they can either strengthen the person that you are, leave you the same, or actually take something up who you are. I've been lucky uh, in that I met uh, someone that was as ambitious as I am, if not more, at a very young age. So we've actually supported each other, uh, which has helped us to be the people we are today. That's the first thing. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, as I said earlier, when we raise our children, it's very important what messages we tell them because it really influences who they become. And even if they are not fortunate enough to actually get partners or life partners if they choose that direction, that are not supportive. The strength of the voice of your parents allows you to survive even the worst. That's very important. In terms of the changes that I've made, it's actually quite interesting, Lynette, in the sense that when you live your life, there is actually no template. There is no uh, to do. You know, the, 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 you know, when you make a, bake a cake, there's ingredients and how you just live your life, you know? And uh, we talk about passion. And a lot of research has been done to identify this passion, to unpack this passion. And a lot of people are starting to be discouraged because they say, but I don't have a passion. Does it mean I'm not okay? The truth of the matter is only 20% of people actually have a passion. So just because you don't have a passion doesn't mean you can't do extraordinary things or leave your purpose. But you just need to allow, if you look at the book, uh, I think it's Lulu Gwagwa who actually says, because that's the first thing I, I know I go around about in terms of answering your question, but I think it's important. Um, she, I actually thought, because I had a passion from a very young age, I assumed that everyone has a passion. And when I interviewed these women that are so accomplished, I was amazed before I read this research that only 20% of the people in the world actually do have passion, that they didn't have passion, most of them. And they, they actually didn't know what they were going to become after they passed that very important grade 12 uh, milestone. And uh, she actually says, I just allowed destiny to guide me, right? When I lost my passion, I'm the passion girl. <laughs> When I lost my passion of being a doctor, uh, it was very scary. It was very frustrating. Uh, I was married with uh, two kids that were, fortunately, they're not too young because, as uh, Uno Ngabo was saying, I wanted to specialize. Every doctor, I have my colleague here, who Dr. Ngozatlova, she's a dermatologist, but she's also has a PhD, thanks for coming. I have U Dr. Lindiwe Gumete here, who actually started off uh, as a teacher, she became a doctor, and she's done so many things, went into. So I actually knew I wanted to be in business. If you read the book, you'll know why I wanted to be in business. 
And when I lost the passion of the only love I think I've had career-wise, it was scary because I was like, oh my goodness, uh, what am I going to do? Because if you remove the MPCHB, then I have my trick. So I have to go back to school and study. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so the beauty though is that I love studying, right? So I, I went and did this MBA and then I entered uh, business. And when I entered business, again, I'm going to go back to the same thing. I'm lucky that I actually had a husband who could pay the bills so I could study full time and pursue my next career and it was possible. Uh, I'm not saying you need to have a husband to change your career. I'm simply saying you can do it, but it will be harder because it was easier for me, uh, which makes it not special, because if it's easier, then it can't be that special. And, uh, but I've met people who change careers, not having those husbands, who save money, who go out, leave the comfort of a biz, I mean, of a salary and actually start something and succeed. It can be done. It's just the levels. Because even if you go to the book, you'll see that if you look at the classes, the social classes of the people, the most inferior class actually has to do that much more than a class that's perceived to be superior. So if you're black, you come from a working class, a rural area, you actually have to do so much more than your white counterpart or another black who is upper middle class who actually is born of professionals. So it can be done, you just work harder. What has sustained me? The support I've received from home. Uh, what has sustained me? My ambition. I'm extremely ambitious. Uh, what has sustained me is knowing that I can because my parents told me I could be anything. Right? And what has also helped is just when you reach one dream, when you expose yourself to other possibilities, it actually exposes the gaps in what you know. And that's the best thing. When you leave your comfort zone, you become a better person because you identify so many gaps in what you know, in who you are, in your personality, that makes you a stronger person than you find because you find ways of dealing with those weaknesses that you actually can miss out on. If, you know, if I stayed as a GP, you get so used to how things are done. You are the master of your destiny in your view. In terms of purpose of life, I was saying actually to my colleagues that I'm feeling at the best of my time in the sense that I feel I'm living my purpose. And there is nothing better than that, you know? I never aspired to be an author, but when I had worked that hard for the doctorate, I thought, and I got so inspired and learned so much from these women that I thought, it can't go to waste. If a hundred people read this book and only one of them inspi gets in inspired and they change direction, they change their life for the better, then my job is done. And the beauty is, can we imagine never meeting someone but touching their lives? Never meeting someone but being able to share such a pool of wealth in terms of wisdom from these women and men. So. I hope I've answered you. Thanks. Before we, we go to the, to the next question, and thank you very much for passing a microphone around, two things that I think stand out there. The power of our voices as parents. I, I remember, and this is your launch, but I'm going on a long story. Um, I remember there was a lady in a block of flats that I used to, to live in, and did something naughty and carelessly just said to the child and the child was three years old and they say by the time you are four by the time you're age four you're fully programmed the rest of it is socialization and the rest of it is learning and unlearning habits what mum judy has just highlighted the power of the voice as a parent the critical voice of the men that we choose to have in our lives. And women. And, and women. 
<laughs> oh yes, and wives, and wives. <laughs> because as, as Mum Judy was speaking, it was entirely possible, if Bob Caesar was a different man, to say, I didn't marry you for you to be going and writing books and doing doors and maybe allowing her physically to do it, but emotionally punishing her for it. Yeah. And that again speaks to the choices that we make as women about the power of the voices that we allow into our lives. Next question. San Bonani. Ninjani. Shine, Judy, shine. Sigalu shine in our pagame, man. Who's introduced? Who's the one who's introduced? Yeah, who pagame foot? Who shine in our lap? Okay, my name is Njavolo Stoel. I've known Mam Judy, Doctor Judy. I mean, yeah, you know, for a long time. Um, I, I want to take a discussion to, you know, another dimension. And by the way, you have a, an excellent panel, and you know I'm, I'm amazed, you know, at the inputs that we've received tonight, and I agree with everything that they've said. What fascinated me about the book was your soul. I did not only read the book, but I also read your thesis, which is readily available on Google, <laughs> and. There is a thread that cuts through the book and the thesis. Um, hence, you know, the, the, the book is based on the thesis. But the thread that I'm seeing is you, you poured your soul there. For somebody who doesn't know you, by going through that, they can read about your values. They can read about your beliefs and also your background which is very important. And my question is around you and the writing journey. I think from this discussion we can take a lot of things. There's a content part of it, but the writing is also very important because um, you alluded to it that we don't have such stories. We don't have such narratives. Um, for us to get inspiration, we'll have to Google and read about your Bill Gates and all that. So what you've done is phenomenal. So the writing part of it, we can learn a lot. So having seen this thread, and for you to have poured your soul in this book, I want to ask, do you think somebody could be a writer if, don't feel, if they don't feel emotions strongly about the particular subject. And this writing journey, how has it changed you? Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Th thanks, Jabul. I've worked with Jabulo for the past 16 years. It's actually been interesting to see you grow, you know, to this uh, beautiful woman. You're a beautiful young woman and you, you know, to answer you. I've only written one book. I cannot pretend to be a, a scholar in terms of the journey of being an author. But I think uh, Dr. Merem has writ written more books than I have. Personally, as you know, Minjabulo, I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I do things that I truly, truly believe in. I give my soul to things. So whether it was the thesis, I gave it everything I have. Uh, with the book, I gave everything I have. Some people actually write for a living. There is a part of me that actually <coughs> thinks they actually give their soul to it. You know? They will write, and uh, we have a budding author here, Mazwi. I think I'll share this question because I think you, you, you really, did it change me? Definitely, Njabul. It changed me. It, it really, every journey and every milestone in my life has actually changed the person that I am. And when I said to Lynette, I feel I'm living my purpose because it's almost 
each one of us in this room, we do so many things that touch other lives. But more often than not, it tends to be lives that we see and touch. The beauty of touching lives that you'll never see is it's really like God, which is what I believe in, is talking to you. It's really like God is saying, I'm using you for this. You almost feel like you, you, you're really serving your purpose. And what next? It's almost there's a voice that says, this is what you're going to do because this is what it will do for other people. And then after this, you'll do. It, it, it's, it's beautiful because it removes you from just you know, rushing to do this, and it's bigger than that. I hope I've answered you. Yeah, I just want to say something quickly because I'm very family touchy-feely. It's so special to me that in this launch, I have my three kids, my nephew, Udomi, uh, my nieces, it's such an honor to have you in the audience. Thanks for coming. Oh, okay, all right. You, you know, I've, I've always been passionate about things, trying to understand uh, phenomena. And I grew up as a, uh, you know, I, I had this dream of being a doctor myself, growing up, being good at science and everything. Uh, I came very close, uh, in, in fact. Uh, <laughs> but but I've, I've always been a, a writer as well. And... Um, uh, being so uh, 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 afraid of public speaking, as you can detect now, I've, I've, I've always, I've always preferred uh, putting pen to paper and uh, putting things down instead of standing in front of people. And I think that's how I ended up writing stuff uh, and 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 trying to um, influence uh, people positively. And, and that's what uh, newspapers are all about. We we tell stories. But while, while we tell stories, we, we, we wish that uh, things move a certain direction. We highlight problems. But it, just like this uh, wonderful book by, by Dr. Lamini, what, what it does, it starts very, very well by, by describing the problem, uh, talking about the 4.4% the that, that, that uh, women CEOs account for in, in the Fortune 500 companies. It, it, it's shocking to, 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 to just read that. It's not new it, it, uh, that this, this is 2015 figures. And it's no different here in South Africa in the, in the, in the JSC companies. The, the figure is 3%. So 4.4% and 3%, you know, it, 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 there's, no, it, there's no difference. We, we, we have an equally uh, uh, daunting task uh, over here in, in South Africa. And, 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 then, and then you wonder why, you know, I, I felt ashamed. I mean, as a newspaper man, we should be uh, uh, telling these, uh, highlighting these problems and, and then offering solutions at the same time, which is what this book does. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maz. We will take one last question. And the hand shot up first from this side. Thank you, Judy and team, for this wonderful launch. My name is Mamsi Kumede, um, and I'm from Durban. Um, in, the, you know, in listening about the book and your thesis, I kept wondering, did you get a chance to probably probe what could be done about access to the significant other, be it any other in the village that raises kids. The issue of access to that significant other to help mentor, to help give access to new boundaries, to new, uh, to crossing boundaries in order for especially the young people to succeed in this world that's getting even more difficult. That is the other way of transitioning to uh, access for them. How do we, and those that have probably transcended to another aspect, how do we then make sure that we open the access for, and we become the significant others for 
those that are aspiring and need to go to the other end of the spectrum. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mamsi, and thanks for coming. Um, what, I'll answer it in two different ways. One of the questions for the thesis was, what are the strategies for gender transformation at leadership level? And uh, the women came with five pillars uh, in terms of strategies, uh, which in a way answers your question in the sense that uh, who are the people that will make the difference and actually allow us to get to where we want to get to? One of them is your immediate family, as indicated earlier on. One of them is men in society, so it's society and the uh, men, the support that you get. Uh, one of them is um, the woman herself, uh, empowering yourself, investing in yourself, creating those networks, uh, identifying those mentors and those sponsors. Uh, one of them is quotas, Toby. Uh, quotas in the sense that people get comfortable employing people who look and sound like them. We tend to do that. It doesn't matter what race, it doesn't matter what gender, it doesn't matter what sexual, sexual orientation. Uh, what quotas do is to force you out of your comfort zone. But what quotas do not do is to ensure that once that's done, then you support the people that you've actually exposed to this, uh, their guinea pigs. They are looked at as like people that don't qualify to be there because they were brought in as quotas. And uh, I remember someone asked me, uh, so aren't you worried that uh, if you are brought in as a quota, uh, people will actually say she doesn't deserve? Uh, so my answer to them was that the reason I don't mind is that if it means life will be better for my daughter, I don't really care what you call me, one. Two, the truth of the matter is, in spite of all the work I've done investing in myself, I wouldn't be where I am if it was not for this government. I'm not saying it's perfect, but they actually empowered me. They allowed me to sit in that boardroom. Therefore, it's important for me that I transform that boardroom, or at least I attempt to transform it because I'm not there because I'm the brightest. I'm there because I happen to be lucky. I was at the right place at the right time with the credentials. So it's important that we do that. In terms of going to the significant other of the women, uh, it was outside the scope. Uh, but what, if you read the book, you'll see there is a small chapter that talks about mentorship because each one of us in this room can be that significant other to that child, uh, the neighbor's child, to that young woman, to that just giving, the, just listening to them and guiding them that I think if you try to do this, it might work, but also just chatting about stories. It's funny how people learn so much just by listening to other people's stories because one of the things that I discovered, I mean, I'm 58 in July, so I'm old. So, but I listen to these women, some are younger than myself, but certain things that I then decided to do after that were informed by listening to their journeys because I was like, is that so? Maybe I should try this. Or just saying, oh, now I understand why I took the decisions that I took, just reflecting, you know? So yeah, uh, Mamsi, I hope I've answered it. <laughs> but I know where to find if I didn't. <laughs> I'm going to take closing remarks. Unfortunately, um, due to the limitations of time, um, we won't be able to take more questions. I'm going to go to closing remarks. I'm going to start with you, Dr. Sidat Khan, because I saw you reaching for the microphone in the context of the significant other. If you can touch on that um, as you wrap up. Okay, um, You've got a microphone right next to you. There we are. Um, Masri, yes, you are a um, feminist. In my detailed discussions and chats with you, yes, you are. So you can call yourself a feminist. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, there is a, uh, uh, Dr. Lamini says there's no recipe, but there is a very specific recipe in terms of our success, in terms of the success of anyone. 
um, she told me a story, and I'm, I'm very glad I have a kindred spirit here, because I also went online and read the whole thesis. So I don't. <laughs> um, so uh, it was either, uh, it, was, it was a conversation that we had, and she, she told me about a moment in her life where um, there was a doctor that came home, and uh, it was at that moment that she decided she wanted to be a doctor, okay? Now, we all talk about passion. Um, passion actually tra uh, translated from um, Latin or Greek uh, means suffering, to suffer, right? So, if we find something that drives us, something, if we can get out of bed every morning, and imagine going to do something and uh, you were not getting any money for it, would you do it? If you feel like that about your work, you're gonna make a success of your life. So that's the first thing. Secondly, we, we cannot escape the fact, I have this theory, I'm the mother of two sons, and my mantra is, whatever boys can do, girls can do better. Uh, Toby, as my student, understands that. And there's a very specific reason that I say that. Because as women, uh, we go out into the world and we see this. It's our reality. We see um, uh, positions that we are capable of occupying. We see roles that we're capable of occupying. But because the way society is socially constructed, if you look at the, 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 the economy of society, if you look at the history of capitalism, the capitalist economy is based on the nuclear family structure. Woman at home taking care of the family, man goes out to the salt mine, so to speak, and brings home uh, the bacon, so to speak. But this is how st the system is, is, is structured. So we saw the statistics in the book. But what we cannot negate in this journey, Lynette, and I think this will somewhat answer your question, or, or, or the beginning of your journey to answering the question, we cannot negate that we are women, we cannot negate that we are black, and we cannot negate that we are still the poorest of the poor, despite our success. And we constitute close to 60% of the world's population. Yet, we, we, we occupy less than 20% of leader, leadership positions, and even less of the economy. So when we speak about a, a, a journey, we have to be very mindful of the reality. And I often hear at, at, at conferences, or lecture series, uh, apartheid is dead and buried, forget about it, move on. And these are from academics. Uh, so, but you cannot, because um, the, the reality of apartheid still lives with us. Um, we might have uh, reached high levels of success as people of color. But when we're sitting uh, at, at schools, we are still in the minority. Um, if there's one child of color on the water polo team, it's cause for celebration because this, ladies and gentlemen, is a remnant of apartheid. So just like the water polo scenario, we have a lot of work to do. And we have a responsibility, because the journey started a long, long time ago. It's our responsibility not only to look at men for leadership roles, but to look at women as well, and the role that we play, because we play an important role. And my two sons and my adopted son over here, we're responsible for their mindset, how they think, how they're going to treat young women, the value system that they're going to teach their children. And if there's a differentiation between what they, uh, the decisions or the life patterns for young girls 
or, or young boys, and for those of you that have children, those are, that's when the inequality starts. So the curfews should be the same, <laughs> the allowances should be the same, and the investment should be the same, and the rules should be the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Toby, closing remarks? It's so amazing. Uh, what else do I want to say after my professor has spoken? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's been a very great evening, but um, I would like to say this to every woman in the building this evening. A house that is divided against itself cannot stand. It, it can't. <laughs> women, women have a lot to do in standing together to address this issue. It's so painful, even in the book it's there. Most of the women that were interviewed do not have women mentors. Because directly, directly intentionally or in, not intentionally, maybe, women have a way of eating on themselves. It was also one of the findings of my research last year. Most of the postgraduate students complain about the female administrative staffs. Like, no, they don't just want to help you. <laughs> You understand? They don't just want to help you. They just get angry at seeing you. You know? <laughs> so, how do we as men, as elderly men, young men growing up, support a cause by a group of people that are against themselves? You know? So, the transformation we seek as a people involves everybody. It, involves, it starts from my grandfather to my father to myself to what I will teach my kids and to the way Every young man in this building look at that woman, to the way we talk to our sisters, to the way you feel when your girlfriend says something to you and you think she's just a woman. Why would she say that to me? No, she can't say that to you. She's human and she's, as equal part, she's an equal partner with you in the business. We are all responsible for the future we create. We can't change the past, but what we do today we determine the future we leave behind for ourselves, for our kids, and for the generations yet to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Toby. Mpume, <laughs> your closing remarks. Yeah, um, I'm torn um, within myself because I don't want to accept the stereotype that women work against each other, one another. I believe that women can work together. And I will say um, this based on experience and Mentally or psychologically, you might agree, uh, Miriam, there as well, is that people we tend to dislike in life are those who remind us of the qualities we hate or hide about ourselves. So when the, a woman is against other women, it's not about a woman against the other woman. It's the woman trying to hide from their own fears. So if you acknowledge that as women, understanding that is at play, when that happens to you, when a woman fights with you, remember, it's not you they're fighting with. It's their own war within themselves that they're fighting with. <laughs> Thank you. Now, with that being said, I, had, um, I read the KPMG's Women's uh, Leadership Study that was published last year. And it says that okay, the, of the surveyed women, um, they said that 82% of the women who are working women, professional women, they believe that net net networking with other women will help them advance their careers. Secondly, they said that um, they wish they knew more about leadership when they're being raised at home to confirm what you were saying. They said thirdly, they've learned more about leadership, not from their male mentors, but from other women through sharing their stories. And this book has given me access to women I would have never probably met in my life to have, to have their stories. And I saw myself and I've learned of things I should be taking care of in my, to improve my career going forward. So for me, I want to say to women in particular is that you have a role to play. When you're in that boardroom, transform it. Unashamedly. They will hate you for it. No one likes you much in life. You can't be like everybody else. It's okay. And you come to, to learn that. If you read some of the stories here, it, it, it's been confirmed. And secondly, when you're in that boardroom, remember, the less of you there are in, this, in that boardroom, the less likely you are to get votes when you need them the most. 
So by you lifting others with you, you will be able to achieve more going forward. So there is no point in us acting out our own insecurities wherever we go. It is up to us to start saying, okay, I've got issues. Go see Miriam, deal with them, doctor, somebody. <laughs> but the, the, it's about understanding your issues where they come from, dealing with them within yourself. But understand, the bigger fight in our country of transformation for women, for black women of and above that, lies with you as women. And I want to ask my, my, my brothers, when we're in there, brothers, we are not a threat to you. We are on, we're in there for the same fight. Let's fight together, because together we'll succeed more. So this book, thank you, Dr. Judith, for this opportunity. It confirmed to me that Alusa continues. Or Alusa continua in, in Latin. The struggle continues. It's not done. We haven't even touched the iceberg yet. We have a long way to go. And it's up to us in here to make it happen. If we don't do that, we can't cry 20 years later and say nothing has changed. Thank you. Mbume, you say something important there about not everyone will like you. There's a, a thing going around, one of those little poster thingies that fly around on social media and somebody, somebody saying, I'm not here to be liked, I'm at a Facebook status. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Maz, in closing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so glad I've been liked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siddharth Khan, for uh, uh, accepting me into the feminist fold. Uh, so um, I, I really feel honored being part of the same club as uh, Barack Obama, um, who, who says in the book, you know, when we are equal, it's only then that we are truly free or more free, uh, that if I remember correctly. So, so, so I'm really, really honored. Thank you very much. Um, the book has so much uh, wisdom, so much practical wisdom. As I said in the beginning, you know, initially I thought it was another doctoral thesis that was going to be hard to wade through. But, you know, I found it so, so accessible. And I, I, uh, speaking as a man, as a, a parent of two daughters uh, and a son, uh, the, 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 so much I've, I've, take, I've taken notes, uh, stuff that I'm already applying since I, I read the book. So I would recommend the book to, to everyone. It's not just for, for senior managers, for CEOs, for people in government leadership, but, but it's so, so useful for, for every one of us because you, you learn things like, for example, you know, we, we tend to say things uh, to, to label children. Uh, you, know, you spoke about that uh, young person being called uh, stupid, uh, brainless. Uh, it, w w it sticks to, 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 to children. It could be from, from, from your father, it could be from uh, your, your mother, but, but it sticks uh, with you. It determines it, it, uh, your, your, your career, your, 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 your path in life. Uh, Dr. Lamini uh, in the book mentions that she did all the uh, uh, accounting, uh, uh, you, you know, it, it, her father didn't say go stay at home, do the dishes, uh, but, but no, come work on the, uh, on the books uh, at, at the shop there. So, so it's so, so uh, accessible, this book, and it, everyone, I, I see the makings of a, a, a workbook. For, for for obviously for managers for for teachers for for but 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 for everyone including parents so so well done well done dr lamini thank you very much thank you very much Ms. thank Not you to thanks very much uh, i just want to thank my panel aren't they amazing yeah. uh, i I am so lucky, I'm so lucky to have had you uh, sharing uh, this place with me. I, I really appreciate the amount of work you've gone into. Uh, I know you actually are busy people, but you took the trouble and read the book, and uh, your insights are, are, are really priceless. Uh, I just want to thank someone who's not in the room, uh, Uzo Dom Simang, who actually helped me. Uh, in identifying people, she helped me. Like uh, you would have seen, there are two beautiful ladies, uh, Angela Nobusi, uh, that come from Econo, 
And uh, oh, Zodra just said, I'm doing it for you for nothing. We, we, we need to celebrate that. Women do support each other. Um, it's, it's an honor to have Umise Sinzama, who is the principal Wase Marine Hill. I'm so happy that she could come. Imerani means a lot to me. Obviously, I got my husband there. <laughs> and uh, also, there are so many alumni. I can see the doctor there. I can see you too. But thanks, guys. We are equally important. But I, it's important that I mention you because we've come a long way. Uh, media is critical. You know, they reach people. You know this thing of talking about reaching people that you'll never meet? <laughs> I met her for the first time uh, in a function Yamshanawami, and uh, media is very important to us. They influence our thinking, they influence who we become, they influence people we look up to. We admire you, we are grateful for the role that you play in the community. Thank you. Uh, Bumi's husband, I met him for the first time today. I'm happy you came to support your better half. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I am so grateful to my family uh, that they could make it. I'm grateful to my better half that he could be here and the sister next to him. Oam Shelly Bele, Siabonga Rakulu. Let's say uh, I'll actually run out now so that I'll sign those books for those people that um, would want me to sign their books. Uh, but thank you so much, Nungnebo, uh, for making it so easy to actually chat about the book. Uh, I am happy if we arrange in good time to actually visit your book clubs and talk about the book. The, the, the talk continues. We need to change this. Yes. Uh, thank you. Sfiso Publishers. Uh, actually, I, I'm the first title they published. I am so grateful for all the support that they've given. Uh, exclusive books, Gateway, Stephen Pillay, thank you. Thank you so much. And the hotel, thank you. Dave, and uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us this evening, and, and thank you very much for participating so actively in, in the discussion. Umam Judy, as she mentioned, uh, will be available for book signings. Um, there are copies of the book. If you haven't gotten yourself a copy yet, there are copies of the book available. And if you do have a copy that isn't signed, you can get it signed, or you can buy your copy now and get it signed. But with that, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Thank you. Mam Judy, Mobile Lamino from Lighteguini. We just want to thank you so much for the hard work that you've put in into this book and the learning that you're giving us as young women. I'm a young mother and I'm, I'm expecting my second child. I'm just going through that phase in my career. And so it is uplifting me and I resonate so much with the material. And so we just want to thank you very much for all the hard work. And for being the leader that you are. Always to Masana, Mam Judy, what a beautiful book. You're such an inspiration, especially to me. It's a pleasure having you in the family. You're such a gem and you've uplifted me and empowered me as a woman. And I could see everything you're talking about in the book. Thank you, thank you. I love you so, so much. Hi, Dr. Judy. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity and this evening. Oh, okay. Should I start with that? Um, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity and this evening. Your panel was extremely insightful and I look forward to expanding information that I've received tonight and from the book. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Buisi Wengubane. Uh, thank you, Dr. Judy, uh, for the book. The session was very inspiring. Uh, actually resonated with the current situation that I'm in and looking forward to reading the book. Well done and congratulations on your PhD. Thank you. Hello, this is Makosi Kane. I just want to say congratulations to you, Judy, for this inspiring book. I'm looking forward to read every bit and to learn from you. Congratulations. Mam Judy. Sekhalal sela ngomsebenzi wakho omuhle 
Owenzi le sibonga kakhulu ukuthi usihlanganise namhlanje sikwazi ukuthi siwubungaze lo msebenzi wakho ukhule umenjalo sibonga kakhulu ngokuthi uhlahle indlela ube inqalabutho kubona abantu besifazane sibonga kakhulu mawami Hi Swagiti Mabaso here and I just wanted to say parting words a huge thanks for this event um, and just like sitting in the audience and hearing your panel and you and your views was so encouraging it was sort of like solidifying like it instilled so many good messages and positive messages that I've been hearing and it made me feel like you know what there actually is a really bright future and we have the support of our elders in what we're trying to do as the youth generation so yeah you're really awesome and I must say like I feel more strengthened in my self determination going forward having heard from you and your panel and I'm so excited that you signed my book my wisdom blesser thank you Hello Judy Mtanaseka I'm very proud of you uh, that you've uh, achieved so far and accomplished all that you've accomplished but I think the book as you say will even uh, 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 spread the word and touch people you will never meet hopefully they will be inspired and they will learn and grow big i learned myself nyakthanda kakhulu bye um siponzuza from esivuno auctioneers mama angibonge kakhulu today i've changed my life i've changed the way i think i've changed the way i'm going to do things because of you because of your move before because of your steps may the good lord bless you and continue to bless you and bless you more thank you Mam Judy Otsuba SBC from the Alumni Association. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful launch and uh, wise words. And uh, I'm so honored and humbled to be part of this. And thank you for remaining humble with all what uh, you've achieved. Thank you. Hi, Mom Judy. Uh, it was such a pleasure coming to this book launch. You have no idea how fortunate I am to have you as a role model and my aunts at the same time. Thank you so much for this and you've inspired me in so many ways. I love you so much and I hope to make you proud just as much as you've made us proud. Thank you so much. My name is Noza Tlova. Uh, Judy is like a sister, a friend, a colleague, and everything to me. And uh, when we were at medical school, she was a senior medical student to us. She has, even though she says she's left medicine, you know, physically exited, but she has not left us behind. She's contributed so much in our uh, uh, outreach projects, uh, support groups that we create for patients and for women. So. I'm truly grateful and inspired by her and she continues to inspire a lot of women and may God bless her and to continue with the great work that she's doing. Aluta Judy. Hi, Dr. Zamini. Uh, I'm Irene Nini Makwaza. I'm so proud of you, Dombi. Uh, I think you have represented our high school, Marin Hill High School very well and you are such an inspiration to all of us thank you so much bye